The Lord really has played, placed on my heart to focus here for this weekend, continue with the theme of Thanksgiving, and be able to get some things out of the Word of God. Okay, are you ready? Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Psalm 100. The 100th Psalm. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you go ahead and look in your version. If you didn't bring your Bibles today, you'll be able to see this passage up on our screens. And you'll be able to follow along. I'm going to speak today about having a thankful heart. If you notice Psalm 100, if you notice that uh, it says it's entitled, and this entitlement has been there for, for probably a couple centuries, that this is a psalm of thanksgiving. So in G Jewish tradition, it is... Uh, believe that Moses actually authored the Psalms from 90 to 100. We're not quite sure about all those other Psalms in there uh, of uh, those numbers. He, he for sure authored one of them. But uh, what we want to see, though, is focus on the fact that it is a Psalm of Thanksgiving. A Psalm of, and if that word is so washed down uh, uh, in your thinking, Thanksgiving means just kind of Turkey Day. Thanksgiving literally means, are you ready for it? Giving thanks. All right? So, boy, aren't you glad? We're coming, we're getting a revelation already. Thanksgiving's all about giving thanks. So, let's go ahead and read this passage, and here's what the Lord wants us to focus on today. You could call this an ex exegetical message. In other words, we're going to go through this passage, and God's going to give us some understanding about what this passage is, and it's going to help us. It's going to jumpstart us even more in the area of giving of thanks, okay? Psalm 100, starting in verse 1. Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. And it is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Then verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, or giving of thanks, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good Amen. Someone say amen to that. Amen. His mercy is everlasting. Amen. amen. And his truth endures to all generations. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. So in talking about Thanksgiving, here's what the Lord laid on my heart to focus on is three things in this passage to get an understanding and get a revelation of what this psalm of thanksgiving is all about, it's really focusing on three things. Okay? In the very first one, I want to bounce down. And if you look in Psalm 100, verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Notice it says, Enter into something here. The first thing that we need to see that God wants to show us is that giving thanks is the path into the Lord's presence. Now listen, obviously this is based on the understanding of Jewish mentality when this was written of approaching God in the temple. And if it was written by Moses, then it was during the tabernacle days. But it's the idea of coming into the presence of God. God is depicted in the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant, in the most inner sanctum there. And to get there, you start all the way outside the temple or the tabernacle, and you walk and you proceed in. Church, listen, there's a lot of Christians that don't understand this. It's really important that we get a revelation of this is that when we come before God, there really is a progression. And I truly believe that many Christians 
fail to really connect with God because they either don't understand this progression or they're not, they're not actually participating in this progression or this pathway into the presence of the Lord. You know, I'm looking down at my wife and my mother-in-law. I think, Sandy, this might have been the first time I met you, but uh, I'll tell on myself. So Kelly and I had been dating just for a couple months, and uh, Sandy was coming in town, and she owned a Christian bookstore in Indiana, and so we were living in Tulsa, finishing up. I was finishing up uh, my last year at Raymond Bible College, and Kelly was a year behind me. And she was coming in with a couple of people. They were going to go down to Dallas to go to a Christian Booksellers Association convention, which used to be huge, huge. Wasn't it huge? And so there, she was coming down to visit Kelly, and then we were going to drive down, so I offered to drive down. Now, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Driving down with a car full of women. So I just started dating a couple months, my wife, and I, like I said, I think that's when I first met Sandy. So I wanted to make a good impression, but oh, it was taxing me. <laughs> so I love, I love ladies. They're wonderful. But you know what? When you get in a car, everybody has an idea of what to do, how to do it, how fast to go, how slow to go, what exit, and so forth. And I did the very most spiritual thing I could do. I just ignored them. So they're talking away and talking away, and I'm acting like, you know, uh, uh, to be honest, acting like I'm a know-it-all, I know how to get to Dallas and all this type of stuff. And lo and behold, what does the Bible say? A fall, before a fall, pride. pride comes before a fall. And so, I, you know, I'm just kind of half paying attention to my driving. I'm actually reading the comics while I'm driving. <laughs> And so I'm driving down the major highway, and I miss the exit, and we're keeping going. And then, where are we? Where are we? Well, I'm on my way to Houston. <laughs> Finally realized what the problem was, and I had to turn around, and I had to, uh, in great embarrassment, uh, humble myself before this car full of wonderful Christian ladies and so forth. How stupid I acted. Here's the point, though. Not only it's a good point about pride and how you need to listen to the women around you. Lord, do you want me to change the message right now? And <laughs> but, but it's important to understand, if you are starting somewhere and you're going to a destination, you need to understand that there is a pathway or a road that you need to take, direction you need to take to get there, right? Well, I got off, and I'm like, I, I was an hour or so, or a little bit over that, out, I had to backtrack and come back to Dallas, okay? So here's the thing. When we think about that, for those of us maybe that are driving, or people that are driving now that are gone, and they're, they're doing their Thanksgiving weekend and on vacation, is if you're going to go from the Milwaukee area to some other city, you've got to have a clear direction path there, or you'll never get there. Amen. And the same is true when we think about this passage, is that it speaks about a pathway to God, into the presence of God. Oh, how much do we want to be in the presence of God? I believe all of us say, man, that... Nothing compares to that. Well, here we've got to stop and say, are we on the proper path or are we going to wind up somewhere else? So when we look at Thanksgiving, notice what it says again on the screens here. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So what we see is that giving thanks is actually the first step on the way of coming into the presence of God. This is inspired by the Holy Spirit, by the way. Penned down, possibly by Moses or some other uh, prophetic songwriter of the days, as the Holy Spirit led them, is that it's important that we understand, if we're going to come before God, we need to know what it takes to come into His presence. Amen. Now, you know, the Bible does have some things to talk about, uh, uh, how we should be when we come into God's presence. And uh, no, we, we don't get real legalistic on that, but it's important to understand you just, we, we believe this. We come as we are, 
But at the same time, we need to understand we're coming before God and we've got to do it His way with the proper respect to who we're coming into His presence. Amen? That's why for myself, you know, I'm, I'm not big on, on, you'll never see me uh, wearing shorts that I'm going to preach. I just, I, I don't see that that is giving proper respect to the Lord when I do that, okay? I remember back when George Bush, during his second term, some of you might remember this, there was a ladies lacrosse team in, at Northwestern University that won the national championship. And of course, a lot of these national championships, they're invited to come to the White House, do a photo op with the president, things like that. And so all these ladies came, and if you remember that, back when that happened, they had this photo op, and it just hit the early internet, and a lot of people were criticizing because there was a number of these college-age girls or ladies that were wearing flip-flops. <laughs> they're saying that's not giving proper respect to go into the White House and wear flip-flops. Now, of course, our, our, the casuality of our culture has, beca- has, has become even more casual since, since the, that year. But it's important to understand, when you go to see the president of the United States, you need to be able to prepare yourself properly. Isn't that right? right. And so when we think, why would we think that it's any different when coming before the very creator of the universe, God Almighty, as Jesus called him, the Lord of heaven and earth. We're going to come into his presence. The Bible does say in Hebrews 4, to come boldly, or, or the NIV says, with confidence before the throne of grace, mm-hmm. that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Amen. But it, that does not contradict the fact that we need to come in a proper attitude, in a proper way. Well, when you come to this particular psalm, it's very important that when we approach God, there's there's maybe some things that we need to think about, uh, how we look. You know, in the Old Testament, it said, hey, come, God's going to come on the scene. You go clean yourself and wash your clothes. That's interesting. You know, I'm going to go before God, and I'm going to be all smelly and wear dirty clothes and things like that. You know, so a lot of times we don't think of terms like that, but... If you start thinking we're coming before God, uh, we want to show him the proper reverence, respect in other words, but most importantly, we got to do it the way God says to do it. Amen? And so when you're talking about this and talking about coming before his presence, the most important thing is not how you look, come on, but it's important what your heart is attitudes are and what you are how you are behaving when you're coming before God so uh, when it talks about here it says enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise it's important that you we don't just come you know carelessly bumbling into the presence of God nonchalantly no okay but it also means that there's something to God in proper manners. I think maybe we need more teaching on manners nowadays. Proper manners in coming before God. Do you know the greatest, uh, I believe without any argument on this, the greatest prayer in the Bible was by Jesus Christ teaching his disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. They come into Jesus and say, Jesus, you're such a a prayer uh, warrior. Teach us to pray. Everything we see in you has to come from a connection, a divine connection with heaven. Teach us to pray. And what did he teach them to pray? It actually was not supposed to be a prayer that we just recite over and over and over. That's how I grew up, man. I just recited and recited and recited and recited. But it's really supposed to be a pattern for prayer. So Jesus said this, pray in this manner. Or according to this pattern. And what did he show us? Very beginning. Our Father, who art in heaven, please give me the needs of my life. Take care of my children. Take care of my job. Give me my bread, my daily bread. No, it starts. Here it is. So the pathway into the presence of God. Here's here's Jesus. He's just emphasizing what Psalm 100 is. is. Start with, hallowed be your name. Come before God in praise, adoration, worship. Do you get that? 
And then after, then becomes what the Bible calls supplication. The, the Greek word that is translated in our English Bible, supplication, is really, now we're requesting something specifically from God for our lives. How many of you have many of those things? You got plenty. And there's nothing wrong. God, want, God wants us to bring those to him, amen? But, but, we're supposed to come first. Everybody say first. We're supposed to come with this pattern of attitude of praise and worship. And what we find in, in Psalm 100 is we first approach him with thanksgiving. Amen? So what do we see here? It's thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So we see thanksgiving and praise. And when we come into the presence of God, then that is actually better defined with the Hebrew words of worship. Amen? So let's talk a little bit more about that. So that's number one. Giving thanks is the path into the Lord's presence. So let me just add one practical thing here then. So it's proper. We try to. We we. We continue to pray and seek, and if you see songs that can really emphasize different aspects, always feel free to give suggestions and recommendations. Email us, text us, and things like that. But here, to start a service with praise and thanksgiving, where we stop and we look and we to take time to assess what God has done. I really believe this, that so many people can come to church, they may have been Christians for 10, 20, 40 years, they can come to church and not receive because maybe for some reason they think that's not necessary today. But it's the same pattern. Do you get it? Coming into his presence, we're going to come into his gates and then into his courts and then we come before his presence. And so God shows us it starts with Thanksgiving. You know, so when we're talking about Thanksgiving, I know a lot of families... Uh, we, our food was getting cold, so we sometimes do this. We don't do it every year, but to stop and say, hey, why don't you share something you're thankful for? You know, giving thanks is so important that we stop and recognize God has done, has done some amazing things in our lives. Amen. So to me, if, if a believer now truly understands this, then they really will be able to connect in church services once again. Because they're doing it God's way. They're not going off to Houston when they're trying to get to Dallas. They're, they're stopping saying, you know, I'm going to stop, and I'm just going to focus on, I've been running, 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 it's been a crazy uh, holiday maybe, but I'm going to stop, and this is the time to stop and say, count my blessings, name them one by one, and give thanks to God. Do you get that? And so praise God. That is actually the, the most important beginning step to have a heart. Praise God. Lord, I'm thankful for what you've done. Woo, hallelujah. So giving thanks is the path into the Lord's presence. Here now as you go up to verse 1. So that was actually verse 4 that, was, that we wanted to start with. But going back up to verse 1 is we see this. It says this. Are you ready? It says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Do you see the words that I highlighted there? Make a joyful shout. It's kind of an interesting Hebrew phrase. The King James actually translated this, make a joyful noise. In other words, God wants us to Make some sound as we come into his presence. Do you get that? So it then says, serve the Lord with gladness. Being glad about it and come before his presence with singing. Now listen, church, this is so important. Once again, some people have never really stopped to understand and get the Bible direction on the proper way to approach God. And thus they've been not connecting properly as a result. Of course. So here, it's important that we then understand that giving thanks is, it's supposed to be lively, and it's supposed to be expressive. Amen. Now, there's a time, there's a time to be contemplative, to have more quieter time in the presence of God, more intimacy, but once again, that's, that's worship. 
that's as we approach into the holy place and then coming into the precious holy of holies, that's where you find that aspect of bowing before the Lord and, and, and uh, the worship, the more intimacy in our interaction. But it's important here, how do we start? If we're talking about giving thanks, amen, having a thankful heart, a thankful heart is going to overflow with gratitude. If you would stop, if I would stop more and start thinking about, man, look, look what the Lord has done. <laughs> Something's going to happen all on its own. You don't need a worship leader to try to stir you up. You don't need a prayer leader to stir you up. It's just going to start all on its own because you're starting to get full of the, the current revelation of how much God has done some things in your life. And it's going to start bubbling up and bubbling up. And what it's going to be expressed as, it's going to end up being some lively expression. It's going to be a, a joyful noise. It's going to be gladness and it's going to be singing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so that's where we need to go. You know, I think back when I started as a Christian. Many of you know my story. I was in the, the 180 church, as I call it, the, the Catholic church. My parents did not allow me for some three years while I was going through the last three years of high school. I couldn't get involved with, go to any church. I couldn't go to any concert until finally my senior year, they kind of dropped that. But I couldn't be involved with any type of campus Christian group or anything like that. And so a lot of my personal growth, I would have died on the vine, so to speak, if I wouldn't have taken steps to keep following the Lord myself. Amen? Amen. And so, by the way, when people say they blame their church maybe for their spiritual condition, no, our spiritual condition always will point back to us. Right. Amen? Amen? But thank God a church can help you, but you've got to, and I've got to make decisions ourselves. And so, one of the things I did, uh, I could go and I could buy literature and books and I could buy records, so that dates me there, and cassette tapes. Some young people today say, what is that thing? That was a cassette tape. And I cut my teeth literally on black gospel music. I was, I was stirred to that. You know, I, that's not like, you know, when I was before Christ, you know, I listened to a lot of uh, pop music. That was kind of my general genre, uh, kind of white bread music. But when I became a Christian, there was something that just drew me to black gospel, and especially a, a, a real famous Christian artist called Andre Crouch. He was huge in the 70s and the early 80s, won all these awards and double awards and all this type of stuff. And I would, I, me and my brother both, because we were both uh, young Christians, we would listen to Andre Crouch, these white boys from the city listening to black gospel charismatic worship. For me, it drastically affected me. And I could see intuitively that how, and I loved, uh, uh, some of you might remember this, Under Crouch Live in London. Ooh, that was my favorite. That was my favorite. I had the album and the cassette. Cassette wore out, I got another one. But oh man, to just kind of listen and listen to it live and to hear, it, and because that was a charismatic revival concert praise god i'm right in the midst of that i can't be a part of church right now but i'm going to church live at london and here i am it's this black gospel that is so expressive so lively so heartfelt not controlled come on not shaped in such a perfect way it's raw and is authentic that's what really responded to me once again, not because that was my music genre I liked, but because I saw in that 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 seemed to be the best expression for, of, of Christianity at a level of praising God that I had never seen before, and it just seemed right. Later, as I got into the Word of God, I saw things, of course, like Psalm 100, is make a joyful noise or a joyful shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo, Hallelujah. 
So, you know, I, I understand, and I love, I love all kinds of genre, and, and I don't want to uh, put down any Christian, you know, all of my love, but there's just something about going somewhere and going to a church that would just kind of let their hair down and say, God is good. Yeah. Well, God, see, I grew up in a church. Blessed be God forever. That's the way it was. And when I became a Christian, and when I especially got spirit-filled, I wanted to scream out in the middle of Mass, Blessed be God forever! <laughs> Maybe I should have done that, then they would have kicked me out, <laughs> and the parents wouldn't know what to do, and then, okay, you go wherever. <laughs> Could have got me on that trajectory a lot quicker, maybe, I don't know. But here's the important thing. To be biblical, God tells us what is the proper approach. Now, I know how all this, we, we like to say, well, my personality isn't that. But the, the truth is, God tells us what he prefers and how he wants someone to come to him. If you're going to have a relationship with somebody, and let's just say you're dating someone, or if you're married now to someone, and they say, you know, I don't like it when you do that, but I like it when you do this. If you really love them, <coughs> Kelly, <laughs> I'm joking, it's usually the other way around. If you really love them, you will change in how you interact with them that will best connect with their desires. What is that called? It's called a relationship. If you just want to be yourself, then why don't you go ahead and just date someone who's just like you? But if you date someone who's a different, just the very differences mean you're going to have to adapt, be flexible, and modify, and realize there's another person, their hearts, their desires. If I'm going to have some intimacy finally with this person, I can't approach them in a selfish manner, a, a way that's contradictory, that rubs them the wrong way, that turns them off. Amen. Amen. And so the same thing is true of God. And so he's saying, listen... I know maybe your personalities, maybe you're raised in a church like me, and you say, man, I just want to go to a, ch I want to go to a quiet church. <laughs> well, bless your heart. Some of you watching the video, if you want to go to a quiet church, bless your heart, then maybe this church isn't for you. But I'd invite you to come and recognize there's something real here that's biblical. Is that say we, it's not like we're, we're swinging from the chandeliers or anything like that. Or we're on, you know, high octane 10, uh, total caffeinated interaction, is that that's the way it goes all the way through the service. But it should start with some enthusiasm. Right. Right. Amen? I really believe people that are, oftentimes are late for services, you miss that great opportunity to just get happy about the Lord. Amen. And recognize that, wait a second, that that's an important aspect for getting me ready to hear from God. It's important for my spouse, it's important for my children, to get in an environment where, man, get around other people that are actually doing what God says. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Make a joyful noise or a joyful shout. Come with gladness and come with singing. Amen. That's awesome. Praise God. Then we find out for the third point is I want you to see this in verse 3. Is it says, know that the Lord... He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. So what do we see? Notice those words highlighted. No, we've got to know something. To be able to interact well and approach God properly and come with that heart of thanksgiving, we need to know some things. And so here's what I'm going to give you for number three here. I apologize, this is a typo. That should be number three. Number three, giving thanks is to be from a faith perspective. That's the only way we can properly give thanks. You know what I found out, church? I have found out that there's really two dominant attitudes that really undermine and, and destroy thankfulness. You know what they are? Number one is an entitlement attitude. 
See, an entitlement, and we're very familiar in our culture about entitlement, the entitlement programs, people, so many people with entitlement attitude, they, they believe that they deserve something. I deserve that. Do you understand, with the attitude of I deserve it, it destroys the need for being thankful for it. You're out there? I deserve that. By the way, it's important that I should insert it here. This is as good, good a point as any. You can't just be thankful to God and not be thankful to other people. I, I try to be constantly a thankful person. And, and it really bothers me when I wonder, did I really thank that person? And sometimes, it's like if someone takes me out to lunch, I'll thank them then at the beginning, I'll thank them at the end, and then I'll t- send them a text, I ever, thank you for treating me for lunch. It's like, I-, I wanted to make sure that they understand, I'm not looking at it like I deserve this thing, thank you for this. And, and I'm not perfect in this area, but I try to be thoughtful in this, and what we need to do is we need to bend over in such a way, backwards, in efforts to give thanks to people. See, sometimes a Christian can say, well, ultimately, it's been given to me by God. Bless you. You gave me that meal or whatever, of course, God blessed me. But you know what? We've got to be thankful for the avenue, the method in which it came to us. Amen. Amen. Thankful that they had a heart to to listen to God, that they were blessed, praise God, and they went ahead and followed through. So we need to be thankful to people as well. Amen. So lest you think that this message is just all about having a giving a, a thankful heart to God, having a thankful heart to God, it's having a thankful heart in general. Because I really don't believe that we can be thankful to one or the other unless we're thankful for the other. You want to be a more thankful person to God, learn to be a thankful person to other people. You want to be a more thankful person to people, become a more thankful person to God. It'll all blend in because a thankful heart is a heart that isn't an entitlement heart. I deserve this thing. About time you saw that. It's interesting, the Bible says, uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said this, there's nothing that you have or we have that has not been given to us. So really an entitlement attitude, it will destroy, it'll destroy a spiritual life. When we start thinking, man, I, I deserve that. I deserve that promotion. Why do I have to be thankful about that? I deserve that raise. I, I, I deserved my spouse doing that toward me. I, I deserve that extra effort. I deserve this from the government. Or You can look all around you. And so it'll destroy a heart of being thankful, recognizing that really, what do we truly deserve? You ever thought about that? Man, I deserve that. Promotion, of course, about time they wised up. No thankfulness there. We, what can help us is we stop and say, well, what did I deserve? If you've been a perfect employee, this might be hard to accept, but there could probably be reasons for almost anybody to get fired. Especially in Wisconsin, where there, you know, there, there's the idea of there's no, what do they call it, the no, you don't have to have any reason. Yeah, it's all with that. Is that you can be fired without any cause. So, you know, what we need to do, church, we will actually be a greater light for Jesus Christ if we stop and realize, wait a second, I deserve a lot of mess. I deserve a lot of problems. Amen. I desire, and I've said these, these type of words here, and a lot of people have choked on them over the years, but if you really thoughtfully think about this, you say you have problems with your spouse and so forth, but we're working on, is you deserve someone to leave you. Come on, so Jesus made it very clear. The bottom line is we deserved hell. Do you understand? That's what we deserved. We are a lost person. Listen, those of you watching, we are lost without Jesus Christ. We are on the path to going to hell. We don't deserve heaven. We won't fit in heaven. God won't let us in. Heart full of sin and darkness. What do we deserve? 
you out there. Well, people came to Jesus, and Jesus, you know, they asked Jesus, say, hey, listen, all these people died from this tower falling down. Why did it happen? And he said, Jesus, let me, let me tell you something. Unless you all repent, you're all going to likewise perish. And then they came to him and they said, you know, hey, all these people, Herod killed some people right in the, the, the temple area at the altar where they're sacrificed. He killed them, slaughtered these people. And they're saying, this is the latest news flash, news breaking. And Jesus said, hey, listen, let me tell you something. They're wanting to know why. And Jesus said, listen, I'm not even going to get into all that. I'm going to tell you this. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So here, Jesus, another time he said this, do not fear someone who can kill the body, but fear him, talking about God Almighty, who can kill both the body and cause your soul to go to hell. That's the proper fear that we should be. You understand that, that we shouldn't be fearing man. We should have our proper fear before God. Ultimately, we'll stand before God. Thank God, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is the answer. As we, as we quoted earlier, He's the way, the truth, and the life. Praise God. No man can come to the Father but through Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. But, 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 what do we deserve? You see, so I know that's a sobering part of this, but if you have a problem with Thanksgiving, you know what? How about just kind of dabble over here a little bit and just think about what do you deserve and what do you not deserve? So you, you start saying, man, I thank God. I can start thanking God for anything. You know, when Kelly and I, when we drive through some really depressed, uh, worn down, poverty-stricken neighborhoods, it's like, we, we just turn to one another and we say, thank God we're not living here. Amen. We probably deserve to, but thank God we're not. God has blessed us. Amen. Hallelujah. And Lord, may, may freedom and light come to people that are living in poverty and things like that. So when you think about that, oh, we're Americans, oh, we're just so wonderful, when over half the world's population lives in poverty. Actually, two-thirds. And so when you think about that, you think, well, we're Americans. We deserve all this. We deserve a bigger house, a, a, another car, come on, a, a fatter bank account, a, a fancier vacations, come on, is that when you stop and say, wait a second, everything that I have has been given to me. In the, the choice point there, it's given, not earned. Amen. That's why I, I, I understand in talking to people, you know, you kind of use some vernacular that, uh, that you can connect with and so forth. But I don't like using the term, hey, uh, you earned that vacation. Hope you have a good time. I don't like that earned idea. We understand that if you worked and you had a vacation time coming up. Sure, we understand that earned. I just don't like using the word earned because what do we earn? We've, everything we have has been given to us by God. And when we go down that train of thought, it's going to be so much easier to give thanks to God. Man, you pull up, say, I'm thankful for this car. I'm thankful for this church. Do you, you think I deserve to pastor you great people? I deserve that. Of course I do. Why do I need to be thankful for you? Of course you should be. <laughs> no. Do you think I deserve to pastor, uh, you know, uh, this great place? And, you know, we've been praying for years. We've been saying for years, God wants us to hug the I-45-41 corridor. You can't hug it any more than this. Right. Only, only way you can do more is get an on-ramp, exit <laughs> ramp. Come on, David, let's work on that one. <laughs> Do we deserve it, though? Do, do we deserve to have nice seats here? Instead of, you know, just raw boards with splinters? Or the last church where when you got it hot and your shirt's kind of always sticking to the back of the pew. It's like, so you, you kind of pull up and say, man, everything we have has been given to us by God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says this. Maybe some of you are married. You need to stop and re remember this. He who has a wife has found a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Another proverb says, uh, has been given by the Lord. My wife is a gift. I don't deserve her. <laughs> so you think about that. There's nothing wrong with talking at times like that to one another. Is that that is a heart of understanding the reality of our human existence. Amen? 
So the first attitude that destroys thankfulness is an attitude of entitlement. A second one, and I'm going to say it this way, is an attitude of perfection. It's never good enough. You ever work for a boss? That's they, they, it's, it's like they're like rationing during the apocalypse or something like this. Their praise and their thanksgiving. No, I can't give you any thanksgiving. I can't give you any, any words of encouragement or anything. I'm holding back. But some people, they can never thank somebody, encourage somebody, bless somebody else because they have an attitude of, of a perfection. Well, if you're waiting for perfection to come, you'll never be thankful. Well, I can't be thankful for my spouse because she's not perfect. Well, you should be thankful for her because, you know, if, if you were more perfect, uh, you know, uh, things would have been a lot different. Come on. Or if she was more perfect, she would have looked at you and said, man, I can do better. <laughs> so when you have this attitude of it's not good enough. So here as we're kind of winding this down. I remember back years ago, my oldest nephew, who is quite old now, but when he was in preschool, his... My brother and his wife, Christians, they were sending him a couple days a week to a Christian nursery. And he'd come back, and they were really stressing something in preschool, and you'd appreciate this, Chris, is that they were teaching them, and he'd come back, and he'd have this phrase, uh, it could be worse. <laughs> and at first, that kind of bothered me, I thought, because I'm getting into the faith message, and I'm thinking, that doesn't seem like that should be in the, in, in the line of Christian thought and so forth. But then I started thinking about this. The idea of it could be worse. Do you know this attitude of perfection is it's never good enough. You'll never be thankful enough. But if you start, say, if you start saying, and then you start saying, man, something happened to me. And if you start saying, well, it could be worse. I'm going to thank God for what I'm, where I'm at right now. Everything could be worse. All right. So we're dealing with the COVID thing right now, and this later, latest uh, uh, variant is happening, and it seems like this thing's not going away. And it's like, okay, you can say, hey, I'm going to be thankful for my health because it could be worse. You out there? So this attitude actually can help us have a thankful heart. Thanksgiving is based on a perspective that's one of faith. Do you know what it says in the Bible? It says in Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank God for everything, but here it's kind of tempered in 1 Thessalonians, same author, the Apostle Paul, he wrote, in all things give thanks, not for everything. You don't give thanks for everything. You don't give thanks for what the devil has done. You don't give thanks for an axe murder or a child molester. Come on. But you do give thanks in all things. And so the perspective is to have this heart, this faith perspective to have, to know the Lord. He's God. It's Him. He's made us and not we ourselves. Praise God. You know God made you. By the way, there's some figurative language in here. It's God who made you as an individual too. You think that you're where you're at in life by your own efforts? By your great intelligence, your great networking skills and abilities. It's God who made you. And so it says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, where it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him, God. It's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, cometh to God, coming in his presence, he that cometh to God, must do what? Must believe that he is. Amen. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Look at this. Let's end with verse 5. This is not up on the screens, but look in your own Bible. And it says this now. For the Lord, he is good. Woo! I think somebody needs to start counting their blessings. His mercy is everlasting. I think somebody needs to start thanking God that your sins are forgiven. That you don't deserve to go to heaven. And his truth endures to all generations. Woo! His love, his mercy is an enduring love, enduring mercy. We've got to know these things. 
We believe these things. We know that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let's all stand to our feet. Praise God. God turn to you.